Okay, so uh, my name's uh, James Jepson, and I'm an entomologist and paleontologist, and most of my research has been done on the lice wings and their allies. And I'm also the co-organizer of the British Isles Lice Wing and Allies Recording Scheme. Okay, so this is uh, the first of a two-part uh, webinar series on the identification of British Isles lace wings and their allies. So what I'll be doing today is introducing you to the lace wings and their allies and how to identify species from images and in the field and how to submit your records. So what are the lace wings and allies? Well, they represent four orders and these are the closely related Neuroptera, Raphidioptera and Megaloptera and the more distantly related Mechoptera. And these are relatively small uh, families uh, with regards to the number of species they have. So you can see here the global diversity, you have Neuroptera, which is around 6,000 species in 16 families. Raphidioptera, roughly 260 species in two families. Megaloptera, 302 families. And Mechoptera, 570 species in nine families. So you can see that these are relatively small orders compared to other insect groups. So when we're looking at the orders themselves, so these are the lace wings, and you can identify the orders roughly by looking at the insects and they have four membranous wings, which are usually roughly about the same size. And they have these wings with these dense intricate patterns of veins. So you can see on some of these images here, you've got these very dense uh, venation patterns on the wings. Uh, the wings are held usually tent-like over the body and they have large eyes, long antennae. And when you see these in the field, they uh, look like really delicate insects. So looking at the snake flies or raphidioptrans, again, you've got four membranous wings, which are roughly the same size. Uh, there's a relatively dense wing venation on these, but not as dense as the lace wings themselves. Uh, the wings, again, are held tent-like over the body, and they've got large eyes and elongate pronotum, which is uh, pretty much one of the defining characters of this group. So you can see here, the, which looks like a long neck to the insect. And the females also have this needle-like ovipositor as well. So this is quite characteristic of this group. And again, if you see these in the field, these are quite delicate looking insects. Uh, the megalopterans, again, uh, they've got four membranous wings, but the wings here are a bit more smoky in color. They've got these dark colored wings, as you can see in the images here. Again, you've got a relatively dense venation on the wings. However, again, not as dense as the lace wings. Uh, the wings are held tent-like over the body. And they again, they've got long antennae, large eyes. And the uh, characteristic um, things about this group is that they have these broad heads. And if you see these in the field, they are quite robust insects. Uh, moving on to Macoptera. Now, these are completely different to the other three. Uh, again, you do have the four membranous uh, wings only found in one family, though, which are the scorpion flies of Panopidae. These are the images on the top here. And you can see that these wings are also uh, patterned as well. Uh, in the other family, Boridae, which are the snow fleas, uh, these have very reduced wings. You can hardly see them on this one here, which is a female. And in the male, these wings are reduced to uh, very uh, fine needle-like structures. Uh, the face on the macopterans is elongated into this kind of beak-like structure with the chewing mouth parts on the end of this beak. Again, they have long antennae, they have large eyes, and in the scorpion flies, uh, the males have this enlarged genital capsule on the end of the abdomen, which is held over the abdomen, uh, pretty much like a scorpion holds its sting. So this gives them the name scorpion flies. Uh, this is only seen in the males. In the females, uh, they have a tapering abdomen there. So it's a bit different with the females. Uh, when you're looking at the snow fleas, the Boridae, so here's one of those at the bottom image, uh, these, the males don't have an enlarged genital capsule, but the females do have this quite um, unique looking ovipositor. Okay, so here is the list of all the British Isles species of Neuroptera. So these are just the lace wings. And in the British Isles, we have six families. So Coneoptera rigidae, 
Osmiodesis cirridae, Chrysoptae hemorrhoidae, Mammaliontidae, and there's 72 species. And you can see here that the Chrysopidae and the Hemorrhabidae, the green and brown lacewings, these are the most species groups of uh, lacewing in the British Isles. And you've got two which are colored in red here, and these are potentially extinct in the British Isles. They've not been recorded for um, over 100 years in some of their cases. So these two here potentially could be extinct in the British Isles. When you look at the other groups, you can see that there's um, a lot fewer species. So Raphidioptera, the snake flies, there's four species, and they're all in one family, Raphididae. Uh, Megaloptera, there's three species, again, in one family, Sialidae. And Macoptera, there's four species, which are spread over two families, Boridae and Panopidae. So they're the living insects. Um, also in Britain, we do have a fossil record of lacewings and their allies. So in Neuroptera, we found fossils in Britain going back to the Triassic, which is around 205 million years ago. Uh, we also find them in the Jurassic, Cretaceous, and Paleogene as well. Raphidioptera have only been found in the Cretaceous in Britain. And to date, there has been no Megaloptera fossils found as yet. Uh, unfortunately, all the fossils of these insects are just preserved as isolated wings. Uh, but you can find them in areas such as Dorset along the coast, uh, the Wealdon, and also on the Isle of Wight as well. So we have fossils of some of the families which are still present in Britain today. So we have fossils of Chrysopidae, Osmilidae, and Hemorrhabidae. Uh, we also have uh, fossils of um, insects families which are still alive today, but not present in Britain. So we've got Ithonidae, Nemopteridae, and Barothidae. So these are still alive, but most of them, as you can see in the brackets here, live in quite far away from Britain today. But in the Cretaceous, these insects were found in Britain. Uh, you've also got some others here. You've got Cycopsidae, uh, Mantispidae, and Nymphidae as well. Uh, you also have some extinct families. So these are no longer alive today. So Prohemorabidae we had in Britain. Uh, we had a, a Raphidioptron family, Mesorophididae, which is an extinct family today. And this really beautiful uh, example of an extinct family, this is Caligrammatidae. And this on the left is a fossil which was found in the Cretaceous of uh, Southern England. And you can see preserved on the wing here, this beautiful eye spot. And here's an artist's impression of what this insect would have looked like when it was alive. And it's thought that uh, Caligrammatids had a similar niche to what butterflies do today. Uh, with the Macopterans, uh, these are known from the uh, Triassic, so around 208 million years ago. And we also have records of these in Britain in the Jurassic, Cretaceous, and Paleogene as well. Uh, we have fossils of the scorpion flies, Panopidae. And again, we also have fossils in Britain families alive today that are no longer present in the British Isles, such as uh, this family here, Eomeropidae. And this family is pretty much at the end of its life as it's only represented by one species, which is present in Chile. Uh, but we did have a, these in Britain back in the Cretaceous. And we also had Bitacidae, which are today spread worldwide, but no longer in Britain. Okay, so back to the living lace wings. So when we're looking at identifying lace wings and allies, um, unfortunately, most of the species can only be identified using a microscope with some needing a dissection to look at uh, very fine structures, for example, in the genitalia. So there is, however, a few species that can be identified easily from photographs or in the field. And with more and more practice, and when you become more familiar with the different groups and species, you can start to ident identify a lot more from photographs or when you see them in the field. So here are some of the resources which will help you identify the life swings and allies. So the most relevant one for the British Isles is Colin Plant's book uh, from 1997, uh, Key to the Adults of British Lacewings and Their Allies. So this is still a very good guide 
for helping you identify any lace wings you find uh, here in the British Isles. And it's still available to buy from the Field, Field Studies Council and it's pretty much still a solid key for identification. Uh, some of the names have changed and some of the key does need updating slightly, but as a reference, this is the best one you can buy at the moment. Uh, there are a few other books like Elliot's book from 1996, which looks at the freshwater megaloptera and freshwater neuroptera. So this has some good keys and some good information. Some of the older books, so Fraser's book from 1959 and Killington's uh, monographs from the 1930s, these still have some excellent information in them, but a lot of things are out of date and some of the keys aren't as accurate as they are today. Um, if you want to look at some of the European fauna, which uh, have quite a lot of overlap with the British ones, there's Aspelk's book, uh, which is in German, but it's a great resource with lots of decent images and a, a good quality key as well, although you do have to translate it into English to use it. And there's a couple of books uh, from Denmark and from Finland, which are really beautiful books with lots of excellent pictures within them. And they do have some good useful keys as well, but again, you do have to translate it to be able to use them. Uh, there's a few websites as well, which can help you in identification. There's the Lysing in Allies Recording Scheme website, which has quite a lot of information on the British fauna, as well as um, some information on how to identify things. Uh, the Lacewing Digital Library is an excellent resource of all things Lacewings, and this covers the worldwide fauna and does have, a, you do get access on here for some uh, PDFs of publications and papers as well. And then there's the Neuropterida from Norway and the Nordic Countries website, which again is an excellent resource with some brilliant photographs and information on how to identify uh, Lacewings in their allies. So when we start looking at identification, you just need to um, have some terminology, unfortunately. And when you're looking at the wings of these insects, the venation is quite important in identifying some of these species. So here's a generalized view of an insect wing with each of the veins have been labeled. So this is something you have to bear in mind when you're looking at um, species of lace wings. So here is here are a few wings from the lace wings and allies with some of the venation labeled on them. Uh, so you can see here some important things that the subcosta is quite important for some identification. Uh, in the Chrysopidae, this cell here, the intermedial cell is quite important as well. And just having an overall idea that the veins are named and some of the names can help you uh, quite a lot when you're trying to identify these insects. And then there's some body morphology. Some of this is fairly straightforward and simple. So the pterostigma, uh, the forewing hindwing, the antennae and the divisions of the insect's body. Uh, the divisions of the leg can be useful as well. And on some of the green lace wings, uh, the scape and pedicel are useful. So this the scape is basically the first segment of the antennae and the pedicel is the second segment of the antennae. So these features are good to get your head around for when you're trying to identify um, some species that you may come across. Okay, so first of all, we'll have a look at the families. So Raphidiopterans, the snake flies, there's only one family in the British Isles, which is Raphididae. Uh, Megaloptera, uh, the older flies, again, there's just one family, which is Sciolidae. So if you find a snake fly in the British Isles, it's pretty much going to be in the family Raphididae. And the same as if you find a Megaloptera, an older fly, it's going to be in the family Sciolidae. Uh, with Mycoptera, there's two different families. There's the Panopidae, which are the scorpion flies, and there's the Boridae, which are the snow fleas. And these two are very distinct from each other. So Boridae don't have the wings, whereas Panopidae do. Uh, there's also the enlarged genital capsule of the male for Panopidae. So 
these two are quite easy to differentiate uh, between the families. With the lace wings, however, it gets slightly more difficult because there's six families and uh, some of the families do look fairly similar. So what I've got on the next few slides is a small key on fairly simple key on how to identify your um, lace wing families. So if your insect had reduced wing venation, so you can see on the image here that the veins in this particular family, uh, there's not many of them on the wing. So this has got a reduced venation. Uh, the longitudinal veins are not branched at the tip. So if you look at these longitudinal veins as they come to the edge of the wing here, you can see they're not branched there. And these are very small insects. There's no scale bar on here, but they're just a few millimeters in length. And one real diagnostic character of this family is that the insects are covered in wax. So you can see on the insect on the right here, that it's got this white granular substance all over the body, the legs and the wings, and this is wax. So if your insect looks like this and has these features, it's going to be the family Coniopterygidae, or the common name for those is the wax flies. On the other hand, if your insect has a dense wing venation, so you can see in the insects here at the bottom, they have this dense wing venation uh, with many cross veins and the longitudinal veins being branched at the tip. So if you look at the one on the bottom left, you can see that the longitudinal veins here coming down are branched at the tip as they reach the wing margin. And these insects are not covered in wax. So if your insect fits this description, then it's likely to be one of these five families. Um, so moving on to the next one. So if your insect has these, the antennae being quite short and club-like, then it's going to be the family Mermelion today. There are also quite large insects as well, these, but the club-like antennae being quite short is quite diagnostic of this family of Neuropterans. And if your antennae is long and not clubbed and they're relatively small to large insects, then they're likely to be one of these four families here. So you can see the antennae of these is quite long and they're not club-like at the end as they are in the Mermelion today. Okay, so for these ones, uh, you can look at the head of the insect. So if the head of the insect here has these structures here called acelli, which are kind of like primitive eye spots, it can usually sense uh, light and dark, and that's about it. So this family here has a acelli presence on the head, and you can just about see them on the image here, the, the black dots on the head just behind the antennae. Um, also with these, they have a distinct uh, wing pattern, these black splodges on a rather uh, clear membrane. And the antennae is um, less than half the length of the wing as well. So if your insect fits these features, it's going to be the family Osmylidae, or the common name for these is giant lace wings. If your insect doesn't have any obscelli, a celly and the wings are various colors and patterns and the antennae is at least the, half the length of the wing and often longer as you can see in the images here with the antennae being over half the length of the forewing and if they're small to large insects around 6 to 45 millimeters they're going to be one of these three families. Uh, the next one is uh, Hemorrhabidae. So what you're looking at here is the costal area of the wing. So this, the costal area is this area here. So the top of the wing is the, the vein is a costa and the area underneath is a costal area. So if the veins, these little veinlets going across in the costal area are forked on the end, um, it's likely to be the family Hemorrhabidae, the brown lice wings. Um, if the Costal veinlets are simple, as you can see in the bottom two here, then it's likely to be uh, either one of these families. Okay, so the next one. So here we have um, 
a family, which is Cicidae, which is has these wings, which are usually the same color as the veins and the cross veins. Uh, there are, is one species, however, which does have color patterns on the wing, uh, which is shown here. But on the whole, the veins are the same color as the cross veins, and the wing membrane is usually just one color. Uh, a diagnostic thing of this family is that the insects are never green. So they're usually dark colored insects, either a darkish blacky brown color or a light brown color. So if the features, these features match your insects, you're gonna have Ciceridae or these sponge flies. And if you have an insect which has long forewings, uh, with the wings themselves, the membrane usually being colorless, occasionally there are some dark veins and the pterostigma, which is this bit here, can often be dark as well. And the insects here are usually green when fresh. So if you have something which fit, ticks these boxes, it's going to be the green lace wings or Chrysopidae. So that's a fairly simple key to help you identify the different families of lace wings. So whereabouts do you find uh, lace wings in the rallies? So they're found usually in a variety of different habitats. So in the woodlands, you can find the families Coniopteridae, Hemorrhoidae, Chrysopidae, and the snakeflies, Raphidiopterans. Um, if you go, go to a habitat near fresh water, you're likely to find Ciceridae, Osmilidae, and Megaloptera. And this is because the larvae of these species, these families, are uh, tied to water. So uh, Ciceridae and uh, Megaloptrans have aquatic larvae, whereas Osmilidae have larvae which is associated with water. They usually live in damp mosses at the edge of streams. Uh, there's also just diverse habitats such as grasslands, scrubs and gardens. You can find quite a lot of lace wings. Uh, Chrysopidae, Hemorrhoidae and Coniopterigidae are found in habitats like these. And you also get the Macoptera, the scorpion flies are also found in uh, similar habitats such as scrubland. Uh, there are a few species which have more specific habitat preferences. So um, on sand dunes, uh, particularly on the marim grass, you have the Hemorrhoidae, uh, a particular species, Wesmelius balticus and Chrysopidae, the species Chrysopa abbreviata, are usually found on the marim grass on sand dunes. If you have areas with sandy soil, you may find the pits of uh, Mermeliontidae. So these are the uh, conical larval pits of the uh, Mermeliontidae, which are the ant lines. So the larvae dig these pits and they sit at the bottom of the pits waiting for uh, unsuspecting insects to walk and fall into down into the pit, into the waiting jaws of the larvae. If you're in an upland area and you've got quite a mossy habitat, you may come across uh, the Macoptron boreus hymalis. This is the snow flea. And there's also uh, this species, which has quite a restricted area in the British Isles. So this is the border brown lice wing, uh, Megalomus hirtus. And this is only found in a few areas uh, round about Edinburgh. So generally on a rocky environment and it's associated with a certain plant, which is the wood sage. So if you're going to actively try and collect uh, lace wings, uh, if you do some sweet netting of vegetation, especially in June to August, you this is often a very productive way of finding um, lice wings in their allies. Uh, if you have a long handled net, you can use this to sweep high branches of trees and maybe sleeve the uh, branch as well to uh, get some of the lace wings which live high up in the uh, branches on trees. Uh, this is particularly good for uh, species of uh, snake flies, raphidiopterans, which you often find high up in the tree canopy. Also beating accessible branches of uh, both broadleaved and coniferous trees can also give you a good result, uh, especially if you go out early in the morning. And if, you're, if you just want to 
do some direct searching. Um, this is good for species of megaloptron, the Cialis species. So if you walk around any freshwater environment, uh, you can usually see the uh, megaloptrons, the Cialis species, uh, just hanging about on the vegetation next to the water body. And this is similar to the Osmilid, Osmilus fulvicephalus. Uh, these often hang out under bridges and on the branches of trees as well near streams and rivers. If you're lucky enough to have a light trap, you can also find a few uh, lace wings as well. So Hemerobidae, Chrysopidae, uh, Coneopteridae often come to light traps. Uh, if you have a light trap near a freshwater environment, then you can get Osmilidae and Siciridae coming as well. Okay, so the next part will be um, showing you how to identify some of the species from photographs or if you find them in the field. So we'll start off with the snake flies, the rapidly options. So it's possible that all four species of Raphidioptrans can be identified from uh, photographs, or if you find them in the field. Uh, two species definitely can be identified from photographs quite easily. Uh, there are two species, however, which can potentially be identified. However, the most diagnostic character for these is on the hind wing. And from photographs, the hind wing is usually not that visible, especially the venation, uh, because it's covered by the forewing, as you can see in this image here. So when you're trying to identify snake flies uh, from the British Isles, um, one character which is really important is the uh, position of the pterostigma, which is this dark area, uh, with respect to the cell underneath, which we've called cell one. So the structure of these two features is very important when identifying uh, raphidioptrans. Okay, so this one is phase stigma notata or the oak snake fly. So as I mentioned earlier, all raphidioptrans have this elongate pronotum and the females have this long needle-like ovipositor. So I said the pterostigma and the cell underneath were important for identification. So we'll zoom into those first. So you can see the pterostigma here and the cell, which is colored in orange here. So the pterostigma here starts about one third to two third the length of the cell below. Uh, the cell one here also extends just beyond the pterostigma as well when you're going towards the um, apex of the wing. And there's a vein, which is vein R, which is called blue here which extends beyond the pterostigma and forks near the wingtip. So this is very diagnostic, this um, situation of pterostigma cell and this vein here to identify uh, phase stigma notata. Uh, there's also another couple of things which are useful for this species. Uh, the fact it has two cross veins present in the pterostigma, you can see them both there. And then in the costal space, you have at least 12 cross veins. So all these little veins going across in the costal area, you need to have at least 12 of those. And if you have all these features, then the species you've got is face stigma notata. And this species is widespread in England and Wales, and it's often found associated with oaks. Uh, the next one is Elanta raphidia michilicollis. Um, Again, as with all snake flies, you have the elongate pronotum and the long needle-like of in females. So again, we want to focus in on the pterostigma and cell one. And as with phase stigma notata, you can see that the uh, pterostigma starts about one third to two third the length of the cell below it. However, in this case, the pterostigma extends beyond cell one. So you can see the pterostigma going off here, whereas cell one ends about here. Uh, vein R reaches the edge of the wing without forking. So that is different from face stigma notata. So if you have this situation here, then it's going to be Atlanta raphidia maculicollis. 
and this species is widespread in England, uh, it's also in Wales and Scotland, however it's most common in the southern parts of England and it's often associated with pine. Uh, there is a species which you should be aware of. It's not actually been recorded in Britain yet. However, it could possibly occur in Scotland. It's uh, currently present in Fenno, Scandinavia. So if we look at the um, relationship of the pterostigma to cell one, we can see that the pterostigma starts, again, one third to two thirds the length of the cell below it. Uh, cell one extends beyond the pterostigma and vein R extends beyond the tip and forks before it reaches the edge of the wing there. So that is very similar to phase stigma notata. Uh, the differences between Rifidia ophiopsis and phase stigma notata is the fact that it only has one cross vein preserved in the pterostigma, as you can see that highlighted there. And in the costal area, it has less than 10 uh, costal cross veins. So if you see something which looks like phase stigma notata, however, it just has one cross vein in the pterostigma and less than 10 costal cross veins, it is likely to be Rifidia ophiopsis. And it would be good if anyone finds this because it would mean that we now have this in the British Isles, but as yet it's not been recorded. Okay, so they were the um, snake flies which are relatively easy to identify from photographs, so obviously good quality photographs. Uh, there are two other species, uh, Xanthostigma, Xanthostigma, and Sibylic and Finis. Uh, the diagnostic characters of these are generally on the hind wing, as I mentioned, which is difficult to see from photographs such as these. Uh, but it is possible that there are other useful characters which can help to identify these. Okay, so this is the ideal situation where you can see the hind wing. So when we look at the pterostigma in cell one, we see that the pterostigma is as long as cell one underneath. And this is the same in xanthostigma, xanthostigma, as well as uh, sibilic and finis. You can see pterostigma as long as the cell below. If you can see the hind wings, then in xanthostigma, xanthostigma, the basal branch of this vein here, which is called MA, is cross vein like. So it's going pretty much straight across into the other vein. Whereas in Sibylic and Finis, this vein is more sinuous and vein like. So you can see it highlighted there. So if you're lucky enough to be able to see the hind wing of these, they're very easy to identify. There are potentially some other characters which can help you identify them if you can't see the hind wing. So what you need to do here is look at cell one and cell two. And what you're looking for are the branches, the veins coming off these cells. So if you have three branches coming off, then it's likely to be xanthostigma, xanthostigma. If you have four branches coming off, then it's likely to be sibilic and finis. And you can make just about make these out on the photographs at the bottom you can see there's four branches coming off the two cells on sibilic and finis and three coming off the two cells in xanthostigma xanthostigma there's also some other features as well so on the antennae on the scape in xanthostigma xanthostigma this is a yellow color you can just about make out the yellow color there and this also has quite a smooth head Whereas in Sibylic and Finis, the scape at the bottom of the antennae is brown color and the head is more co coarsely sculptured, so a lot more rough looking. So these features could potentially allow you to identify them uh, based on forewing venation and a bit of morphology on the head as well. So this is quite useful uh, to identify these species from photographs. And xanthostigma, xanthostigma is fairly widespread in England and Wales, uh, but localized in Wales, sorry. And Sibylic and Finis is widespread, but local in central, eastern and southeast England. Okay, so that's the Rafferty Uh Megaloptera 
are a lot more difficult to identify from photographs and in the field. Um, the wing venation and general morphology of all the three species of megalopterans in the British Isles are pretty much identical, They're very similar. So if you had a photograph such as this one here on the left, uh, you would not be able to say what species that was. Uh, it's still worth recording. You can record it as um, Cialis sp, but other than that, you can't get it down to species level. Uh, what you need to do is look at the genitalia. So this is possible to identify species in both males and females. Uh, it could be possible to identify males in the field. Uh, for example, here you have the abdomen of a megalopteran, and you can see the genitalia quite clearly here. So with this one, you can see the bottom part here, which is S9, as labeled on this diagram, is very long and about the same length as the top part of the uh, genitalia here. So if you see something like this, and it is possible to do this in the fields with a hand lens, uh, you can identify this species if it looks like this with this very elongate S9. Uh, this will be Cialis lutaria, which is the most widespread and common of the uh, megalopterans. But for the other species, even the males, it's very difficult to identify these species um, out in the field or from photographs. Okay, so we'll move on to the lace wings next. Uh, so, unfortunately, with these, uh, most species require you to collect specimens and to identify them using a microscope. So, for example, with the family Coniopterygidae, so these are the tight, very small wax flies, um, all the species require a microscope to identify. You can't identify these from photographs at all. So uh, to identify any species of Coniopterygidae, you need to collect specimens and look at their genitalia. For the families Hemerobidae and Chrysopidae, most of the species of these do require a microscope for identification. They're quite difficult to identify from photographs. Um, the families, however, Osmilidae, Ciciridae, and Mermeliantidae uh, can be identified um, in the field or from photographs relatively easy. So we'll start off with the um, most difficult ones. So this is Hemerobidae, this is brown lace wings. So in Britain, there's around 32 species of uh, brown lace wings, and they can look very similar. So these are pretty much little brown insects. Um, there's only a few of these which can be confidently identified from photographs or in the field. And the brown lace wings are found in a variety of habitats and some species do come to light. So the features you're looking for to help you identify uh, species of brown lace wings are they're quite small and often uh, related to wing venation. So there's a vein at the base of the costal area. So this area is a costal area. And this vein at the bottom is the humeral vein. Uh, so what you're looking at in hemorrhoidae is whether you have a recurrent humeral vein. So the vein starts and then bends back on itself and then you get little branches coming off. So that's a recurrent humeral vein. Uh, in some species, this humeral vein is just straight across and simple. So that's those are good, well, this is a good diagnostic feature for uh, brown lace wings. Uh, you also want to look for this cross vein, the RMCV, and you want to look at the position of this cross vein with regards to the fork of this vein here, M. So in this situation, the RMCV would be after the fork of M. And there's one other cross vein which is important, which is the MCCV, uh, which is between the M vein and the cubitus vein here. So you can just about make it out here. So what you're looking for with this vein is whether it's pale or whether it's dark and whether the membrane around it is also colored. So in this situation, you have a pale MCCV. In this situation here, you have a dark MCCV. So these are 
this is why brown lace wings are quite difficult to identify from photographs because a lot of the features for identification are quite small and relatively difficult to see. Okay, so we'll start off with uh, this one first. And this is a very diagnostic one, uh, Drepanepteryx phalanoides. Uh, if you see a lace wing, which is this nice chestnut brown color and has this little hook to the wing here, there is no other species this could be of brown lace wing in the British Isles. So this is very easy to identify. And it also has this habit of tucking its head under its wing as well, uh, which makes it look like a dead leaf. So this is a very distinctive, easy to identify species if you find it. So you're just looking for this hooked wing, wing here and this chestnut brown color. So this lace wing has very disjunct distribution. It has centers in the southeast and northern England and the rest of the records are quite isolated. But it is a very uh, distinct insect and easy to identify just based on this character here and its habit of sticking its head under its wings as well. Uh, Micromus ferrigatus is also uh, very easy uh, brown lace wing to identify. Uh, this one is widespread and common and you're quite li likely to come across this species. Uh, it has a brown body, it's quite small as well, so it's only like a few millimeters across. And the diagnostic characters of this is that it has these pale looking wings and it has this distinctive color pattern of these three brown blotches. So you can see them here and on the isolated wing as well. And another thing to look out for with this is the humeral vein is simple. So humeral vein here, it's just a straight vein going across. It's simple. It's not recurrent. It's not bending back on itself like some of the other species. So this is quite an easy species to identify as well. Uh, there's Megalomus hirtus as well. So this is, as I mentioned earlier, restricted to just a few sites in Edinburgh and associated with Woodsage. But if you're ever in that area and you come across uh, a brown lace wing, uh, these are quite simple to identify as well. So these have a recurrent humeral vein, which I've highlighted here. Uh, it can just about make out here bending back on itself. Uh, it has a wide costal area as well. So the costal area is quite wide compared to many of the other brown lace wings. And it has at least six branches of the radial vein here. So these are labeled here. So branches are coming down like this, and there's at least six of them. So this one is, again, quite easy to identify, but uh, it's only found in a few sites around Edinburgh. Uh, here, it gets a bit difficult. So this is Hemorobius nitidulus. And now we're starting to look at more fiddly characters, which are a bit more difficult to see from photographs. So what we want to do is look at whether it has a recurrent humeral vein, which this one does. Uh, you can just make out on there, but I've highlighted it on the image at the top. Then you need to find the cross vein RMCV and look at its relationship with the fork of M. So the RMCV cross vein is this vein here. It's quite pale, but it is before the fork of M. Then you need to find the MCCV cross vein and see whether it's dark or pale. And in this case, it's highlighted here, it's quite pale and fairly difficult to see. So what you can do after you've found these features is to have a look at the wing membrane itself. And you can see it's quite pale, there's no uh, patterning on it at all. And if you look at the veins in detail, you can see that the longitudinal veins have these little dots on them. And these dots, are the length is about the same size as their width. So they are dots and not dashes. And this is all diagnostic if you have all these features of this species here, Hemorobius nitidius. We can see how difficult it can get with identifying some of the brown lace wings from photographs. And here's another one. This is Hemorobius stigma. So 
we're having a look for the humeral vein and you can see that it is recurrent. It's bending back on itself with the little branches coming off it. Uh, the MCCV vein is dark and the RMCV cross vein is present before the fork of M. So these are, again, looking for these features to help you identify that. And the wing membrane in this species does have patterns on, has this shading, these stripes going across the wing. Uh, it has an orange called pterostigma, which is quite diagnostic of this species. Uh, and it doesn't have a pale thoracic stripe. The top of the thorax is the same color as the side of the thorax. So all these come together to um, tell you that this is hemorrhagic stigma. So this is a widespread uh, lace wing and it's associated with Scott's pine. So that's the uh, brown lace wing. So you can see that a lot of the features are quite, quite finicky to find and see, especially in photographs. But um, when you do become more familiar with these groups and if you do a lot of identification of these, it can become a lot more easier to identify the species from photographs. So moving on to Chrysopidae now, these are the green lace wings. So in Britain, we have around 21 species. Um, a few of them can be confidently identified from photographs or if, if you find them in the field. And as mentioned previously, they're found in a variety of habitats and they do occasionally come to light. So one of the important features you're looking for with the green lace wings is this little cell here, the intramedial cell sometimes labeled as IMC. And this is a small triangular cell, which is on this vein here. And you're looking for the relationship of this cell with this cross vein RMCV so here. So in this situation, RMCV is away from the intramedial cell. Whereas in the situation here, the RMCV coincides with the intramedial cell. Okay, so the first one is probably the most common group of lace wings you'll come across. So this is cr the Chrysoperla carnia group. So here, the intramedial cell here is quite far away from the RMCV cross vein. So this tells you that you are looking at the uh, Chrysoperla carnia group. And it's a group because it uh, combines three very similar looking species. So it's very difficult to uh, differentiate between these species uh, through their morphology. Uh, one of the best ways to do it is each of them sing a different song, but without specialist equipment, it's very hard to uh, pick up on that. So if you find a, a, a species and it has this situation, it's it's perfectly fine to identify these just as Chrysopella carnia group. And that's that'd be useful for us with the recording scheme. And these are, as I say, widespread. And these are the lace wings which come into your house and overwinter. Okay, so the next one is this quite interesting looking uh, lace wing. This is Notochrysa. Um, Capitata. And this is the most common of the two species of Notochrysa that we get in the British Isles. So first of all, we hunt down the intramedial cell and in this species and in this genus, it's more of a rectangular shape rather than the triangular shape of the other species. Uh, these insects also have a, quite a bright orange head and an important feature is the top of the thorax is a red brown color. There's no pale stripe. So this is quite diagnostic for this species. Uh, occasionally you may find this white blob on the uh, abdomen of the insect. And this is a spermatophore, which is a package of sperm, which is passed from the male to the female. So these are quite a relatively easy, distinctive um, lace wing to identify. And they're widespread and fairly local in England and Wales, but scarce in Scotland. And you often find these associated with pines. The next species is Notochrysa fulviceps. 
And this is the least common of the two notochrysis species. So again, we look for the intramedial cell. You can see here is rectangular in shape, which fits with the uh, genus. It's got a bright orange head again, but what's different here is that it has a broad pale stripe down the thorax. So this is the distinctive uh, diagnostic feature of this species in the British Isles. So as mentioned, this is relatively rarely recorded and it could well be rarely recorded because it's usually associated with the tops of mature oak trees. So unless you get in high up into the tree canopy, you may not come across these species. But it is a fairly distinct and relatively easy to identify species. Uh, the next one is a very widespread and common species. This is Chrysopa perla, or the uh, pearl lacewing. So again, look for the intramedial cell. You can see it here, and you can see that the RMCV coincides with it. So other features you're looking for with this species is that the second antennal segment, the pedicel, is black color. So you can see that just here on this image where the arrow is pointing. Uh, the head also has extensive black markings with a small pale circular area on the top of the head. So you can see that quite clearly here, this small circle on the top of the head. It's got a blue-green color and it's dark underneath the abdomen. And an important character here is to find the vein SC. So the top vein here on the wing edge is the costa vein. And then the second longitudinal vein is the subcost of the SC. And in this species, it is a green color. So that's quite important. So if you find these features together, it's going to be Chrysopapella. And this, like I said, is widespread and common. It's associated with scrubby grassland and woodland edge habitat. And this is one of the most recorded um, lace wings on iRecord. So lots of people record this species. Uh, the next one is Chrysopa dorsalis. And what you're looking for here is on the head, again, the second antennal segment is black, uh, but instead of having a circle on the top of its head, it's got a more elongate patch, more rectangular uh, pattern on the top of the head. Uh, it's still got extensive black markings around it, but you're looking for the pattern here not being circular, being more rectangular. Again, it's a blue-green color. And what's different, again, between this and Chrysopa perla is vein SC is not green, it's black here. So you've got the costa at the top, and then the second longitudinal vein going along is the SC, and this is black. So that helps you identify this species. Uh, this is quite a local and rare species, and it's often associated with pines. Another species which is relatively easy to identify from images is Ninita vitata. So again, look for the intramedial cell, this triangular cell here, and its relation to the RMCV cross vein, and they coincide here. Uh, other important features are the second antennal segment is green in the species, and there is no dark spots between the antennae. Uh, but the most striking feature of this insect is that the scape, the bottom segment of the antennae, is twice as long as wide. So it's very dramatically enlarged, which you can see quite clearly from the photograph. So it's a relative, relatively easy species to identify this based off this uh, enlargement of the scape. And it's quite a widespread and common species as well. So they're the chrysopids and they're the species which are relatively easy to identify just from photographs. Uh, moving on to the another family now, this is Osmilidae or the giant lice wings. So there's only one uh, sp species in this family in the British Isles, so it's quite easy to identify. Uh, as mentioned earlier, you're looking for the ocelli on the head, so these black dots on the head just behind the antennae. And this species has quite a bright red head and has this distinct pattern on the wings, this, these blotches on a quite broad uh, wing which has a clear membrane. And these are quite large 
insects as well. So roughly about 20 millimeters full wing clip there. So they're quite distinct and quite readily identified when you see them in the field or from photographs. And these are widespread and common uh, across the British Isles. Uh, the larvae are associated with water, so you get the adults hanging around by waters on fallen trees or under bridges. And if you have a light trap near freshwater environment, you may get these coming to light traps as well. So this is quite an easy family to identify. So the next family, Ciciridae, are these sponge flies. Uh, there are three species in the British Isles, and with practice, all three can be identified from good quality photographs or in the field. However, if you do collect them, they're very easy to identify from their genitalia as well. They have quite distinct genitalia between the species. Uh, the larvae of these are associated with freshwater sponges, so they have an aquatic larvae, and the larvae themselves feed on these freshwater sponges. And you often find the adults on uh, riverside vegeta uh, vegetation. And again, if you have a light trap near freshwater, you may get them coming to light traps as well. Um, the thing is with the uh, Ciciridae is that they are quite like little brown insects. So they may be mistaken or confused with uh, brown lace wings, the hemorrhoids. So one way you can differ differentiate between hemorrhoidae and Ciciridae is to look at the forewing venation. So in hemorrhoidae, you have, so you've got the costa running across the top, then the next vein is the subcosta, the SC, and then you have the radial vein, which is R. And with the radial vein in hemorrhoidae, this has branches coming off like this, so these pectinate branches coming off. In Ciciridae, uh, you've got your costa at the top, and then you've got the subcosta, then you've got the radial vein, but then you've got another vein, the radial sector vein, which is going across here. And then you have your pectinate veins coming off the radial sector vein here. So by looking at the configuration of SC and R and SC, R and RS, you can differentiate between these two families. So going to the sponge flies and uh, identifying the species now. So the common sponge fly, Cicera nigra, uh, this has veins which are the same color as the cross veins, which you can see quite clearly there. They also have a quite a dark, smoky look to the, uh, the wing membrane as well. And the antennae are dark colored. There's no different colors in the antennae. So these features do allow you to identify the species fairly easily from photograph. And this is a, a widespread and common species and often found on static or slow flowing water. And we do know what the host sponges for this um, lacewing are too. So the larvae of uh, the common sponge fly feed on Spongilla lacustris and Ephidatia fluvitilis. So the other two um, species, uh, you have Cicera term terminalis, which is the it's a rarest sponge fly in the British Isles, and it seems to prefer uh, streams which are overhung by trees. And you can identify this one by looking at its antennae. So it's got quite dark antennae going all the way up until the tip when you have this light color. So by seeing this, it allows you fairly easily to identify that this is a uh, Ciciri terminalis, just based on the antennae. Uh, the last one, uh, Ciciri dali, uh, the wing membrane here has dark patches around the cross vein. So you can see the cross veins going across on the wing and on the either side of these cross veins, you can see some dark patches. And occasionally on the membrane itself, you can get some uh, dark patches as well. So this is the only um, sponge fly which has these color dif differences on the wing. And if you look at the antennae, the base of Ciciridale is quite light at the base, but then dark as you go across the other phagelmias. So this one is, again, quite a, a local and scarce species. And it, lots of records have been uh, taken for this from fast flowing upland rivers. Okay, so the last species of lacewing, the last family is uh, Mermeliontidae. 
So these are the outlines. So we have uh, two species of these in, which are found in the south of Britain. So you have Euroleon nostris, which is the most common. This is found in the Channel Islands and in and around Suffolk, especially in the coastal parts. And Mermelion formicaris, which has just been found on the Isle of Wight. So both of these are identifiable from photographs. And the larvae themselves, as mentioned earlier, dig these conical pits to catch their prey. So we'll start with Euroleon nostris. So as mentioned, this is the most common of the two ant lines. And as with all Mermelion today, they have the antennae thickened at the tips of this club-like short antennae. Uh, Euroleon nostris has this light grayish color to the body, and it has transparent wings with these um, quite diagnostic dark marks going across it. And the pterostigma, so this bit's here on the wing, is uh, black and white, so that's quite uh, diagnostic to identify the species. Uh, the forewing tips as well are fairly rounded, especially when you compare them to uh, Mermelion uh, formicarius. So this is quite an easy um, lace wing to identify from good quality photographs. Uh, the next one, Mermelion formicarius. So there's only been one record of this from the Isle of Wight, and that could have been a possible visitor from Europe where it's uh, fairly common. Uh, but there's no reason to say that this species couldn't become established here in the British Isles. So again, as with other Mermelion today, it's got the antennae, which are thickened at the tip. Uh, how it differs, differs to Euroleon nostris is that it has a dark grayish brown color to the body. Uh, the wings are transparent and it doesn't have any uh, stripes or blotches going across it. Uh, the forewing apex is a lot more pointed and the pterostigma, rather than being black and white as in Euroleon nostris, is just white. So this again is a fairly easy um, species to identify from photographs. So the last order to look at is Macoptera. So these are the scorpion flies and snow fleas. So male scorpion flies are very easy to identify from photographs if the photograph is taken in the right orientation and also very easy to identify in the field as well with the hand lens. Uh, females, however, do require dissection to confirm the identity. So if you have a female, uh, you're not going to be able to identify that from a photograph. In the future, it could be possible to use wing patterns for identification. However, this still needs to be tested. Um, when you're looking at the snow fleas, so the little Boridae, these are easy to identify because we only have one species of this family and they're quite um, distinctive. So the scorpion flies themselves are found on uh, dense vegetation. For example, brambles, uh, you can often find them there. Uh, snow fleas are usually found in mossy areas in uplands and uh, different to the other insects, they are actually active in the winter months. So the important character here to look at when identifying uh, scorpion flies is the genital capsule and these structures on the genital capsule, the calipers. So we'll start off with uh, Panoapa cognata. So this is uh, one of the least recorded of the scorpion flies, but it's, it's quite local in England and Wales, but quite rare in Scotland. So first of all, we just zoom in onto the genital capsule. And here you can see that you've got these caliper structures on the capsule here. And you can see that they're quite slender and they're diverging as you go to the top of the uh, genital capsule. So the, here's a drawing of them. You can see that they're quite slender. And as they get to the top of the genital capsule, they're diverging. So basically, if you see this uh, configuration of the genital capsule and the calipers, then you can identify that as Panopa cognata quite easily. Uh, there are other features which uh, help you identify it. So it's got a red head. And the sixth abdominal segment has quite a broad tip to it. So you can see it's quite broad going across the tip of the sixth abdominal segment. So that's another feature to identify by. However, all you need to do really is look at the calipers on the genital capsule to identify these. 
Uh, the German scorpion phynex, Panopa germanica. Again, zoom into the genital capsule and you can see the calipers here. And these are parallel. They do sometimes diverge slightly at the top, but they are expanded at the tip. So they look quite paddle-like. So here's a picture of the uh, calipers on the genital capsule, but you can see them quite clearly there. So again, if you see that, then straight away, this is going to be a Panopa germanica, quite easy to identify. Uh, these have a dark head, uh, which is different to Panopa cognata. And the six abdominal segment with these is tapering. So it's not got that big blunt end to it. It just tapers nicely into the, the seven, seventh abdominal segment there. So again, it's just a case when you have the males and you can see the genital capsule in the photograph quite easily. It's very easy to identify these two species level. Uh, Panopa communis, again, find that genital capsule and zoom into it, have a look at the calipers. And you can see that these are uh, quite slender. They curve upwards towards the middle, but then they converge back in towards the tip. So again, this is easily identified these as Panopa communis. Again, they've got a dark head and the six abdominal segment, as with Germanica, uh, tapers at the bottom. It doesn't have that broad uh, tip to it. And these are very widespread and abundant in England and Wales, but fairly local and rare in Scotland. Uh, there is, again, potentially another scorpion fly species which may make its way over to the British Isles at some point. Um, this one is very similar to Panopa communis in the structure of the uh, genital segment and the calipers on it. So you can see you've got Panopa communis here with the uh, calipers going out towards the middle, then converging back at the tip. And this is pretty much exactly the same in vulgaris as well. So the way you can differentiate between uh, vulgaris and communis is by looking at the color pattern. So this little black spot at the base of the wing in communis, this just covers one cell. So it, it's only found between two veins. Whereas in Panopa vulgaris, this goes across three veins, so into two cells. So it's a much bigger spot there. So if you have something which looks like communis but has this big black spot at the base of the wing, it could potentially be Panopa vulgaris. So that's something you need to look out for when you're identifying these species. So here's a comparison of the three uh, scorpion flies. So you've got the genital capsules here of communis, germanica, and cognata. And you can see that each of the calipers are quite distinct. And if you get a good photograph of those, you can easily identify the species. I did say that potentially in the future, you could be able to identify by wing pattern as well. So with communis, you have this dark stripe in the middle and then quite a dark tip. In Germanica, you have a dark tip, but more of a spotty pattern going across here with it, a dark stripe. Uh, you also get a different form, a borealis form, which is found up in Scotland, uh, where you've hardly got any color pattern on the wing. And this is still uh, Panopa Germanica, just a different form. Uh, Cognata has only a half stripe here and a very patchy uh, dark tip. So potentially you could be able to identify from the cult pattern. However, Panopa germanica does have some which have more of a bold stripe going down the middle. So fairly similar to communis. So it isn't foolproof at the moment and work needs to be done to double check that there are ways you can identify from accurately from wing color pattern. So at the moment, the best way is to use the uh, male genital capsules for identification. So the last insect to look at is the snow flea, uh, Boris hymalis. And this one is quite a distinct looking insect. So there's nothing really that looks like this. So it's quite easy to identify. In the male, the forewings have been reduced to these spines, which is quite interesting, quite diagnostic. Uh, you've got the elongated face, which all macopterans have. Uh, females, the wings are very much reducing. You can hardly see them, but it does have this distinct ovipositor. 
Uh, they also have quite long legs as well, and they're really tiny. They're about five millimeters long. And you find them in upland areas associated with moss. And as I mentioned before, these are active in winter. And if you're up in moorland and it's been snowing, sometimes you can see them just running across the snow as well in winter. Quite an interesting um, uh, species of insect, these. OK, so that's uh, going through all of the species which you can relatively easy identify uh, from photographs or if you have a hand lens in the field. Uh, just a note on photography, if you are taking photographs of um, lice wings and allies to identify uh, later, um, some tips are with lice wings and snake flies, if you get a good in focus view of the wing, the forewing on the side, uh, that is very useful. And also if you get an image of the top of the head and the top of the thorax, that is also um, quite useful for helping you identify them. So they're two good orientations you should try to do if you're taking photographs. Uh, with macoptrans, the scorpion flies, uh, you just need a good picture of the male uh, genital capsule and the calipers on the top. If you get a good picture of that, you can uh, identify the species. Uh, but it's also good to get a picture of the wing pattern as well in case you have for example, uh, Panopa vulgaris with the big black spots on the base. So that's worth thinking about if you're just uh, taking photographs for identification purposes. Okay, so if you do have any records of uh, lacewing and allies, it'd be great if you could submit them to the uh, British Isles Lacewing and Allies recording scheme. Uh, to do this, you can email them to me at lacewingiris at gmail.com, or you can email them to Colin Plant as well, colinwplant at gmail.com. Uh, if you use iRecord, then those records will eventually find their way into a database. So that's another way of doing it as well. Uh, if you need any help with identification, um, I verify all the British Isles records on iRecord. So if you submit something, even if you just label it as Neuroptera, I can identify that. And if I do identify things for people, I do tell them how I've identified it as well. So then hopefully in future, you'll be able to use that to identify them for yourselves in future. Uh, there's also quite a few good uh, county verifiers as well on iRecords who uh, verify records for specific counties. So they'll also offer help as well. Uh, if you have any uh, specimens, uh, you can send them to me or call in for ID or verification. So you just need to email one of us to uh, uh, sort out arrangements for postage and things like that. And if you have any images you want uh, to be identified or for verification of your identification, uh, you can, again, e email them to me or to Colin as well. Be happy to look at them. Um, one thing I will mention, if you do upload things to iRecord or send in uh, records, if you could say how you've identified it as well, so whether you've used a key or um, which features you've used to identify them, so whether you've taken a specimen or to the genitalia, things like that, would be useful and help me uh, to verify them as well. So that'd be a good thing to uh, put into any records. And if you're interested in the British um, Isles Lacewing and Recording Scheme, um, here's a bit of information. We have around 26,000 records so far, uh, ranging from the 1800s to the present day. Uh, we do have a newsletter which comes out at least once a year, and we have a mail list with around 456 people on at the moment. It might be a bit more now, but I've not checked recently. Uh, there is a Facebook group as well, which has around 45 members. Uh, you can join that and upload pictures of lace wings uh, for people to identify as well. Um, if you want to be added to the mailing list uh, for the uh, recording scheme, uh, you can just drop me an email and I'd be happy to add you onto the mailing list. Uh, we do have a web page as well, which is temporarily being hosted uh, on my domain because uh, Scratch Party is now not supported, so we've had to move the website. Uh, but that's worth going to having a look. Uh, it's got information on the British fauna as well as um, advice on how to identify things and some images as well, including the archive of newsletters. Uh, so that's worth having a look. And yep, the Facebook page, feel free to join that as well. Um, 
to get things identified and uh, to uh, look at what other people are posting as well. So the image here just on the right just shows all the records so far, uh, which have been collected by the Lysman Ganali's recording scheme. And you can see places like Ireland, we have very few records. Uh, places in Scotland, again, very few records, parts of Wales as well. So if anyone does record insects from Ireland, Scotland, parts of Wales, it'd be great to get some of those uh, records uh, to give us a more full view of the distribution of lice wings in, in the British Isles. Uh, so next week, I'll be doing a part two, which will be identifying lice wing allies with a microscope. So this will be looking at things like genitalia characters. And this will be still useful for people who don't have a microscope because I'll be going through characters, which again, you can see using a hand lens uh, to help you identify things maybe down to just genus level as opposed to species. So uh, it's worthwhile turning up to that, like say, even if you don't have a microscope. And uh, I think that's it. Yep. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much indeed, James. That, that was excellent. Um, really nice to see that last nap with the Northwest England so well represented, actually. So that's, that's, good absolutely. history of recording on there. Um, no, I think, you know, lace wings do have, uh, you know, a bit of a, a reputation for, for difficulty and for, you know, with it, a lot of it being wing venations, et cetera. But I, th I think you, you've really shown there how much progress can be made um, with a lot of things um, through through photographs. Um, and I think as in um, February, when you came in and delivered um, a great workshop at, at World Museum in Liverpool, you know, there hadn't been probably one in, in Britain for many years, <laughs> someone, doing, someone doing a workshop. And, and the same tonight, really, I think you're you, you're breaking ground here, really, because, you know, the, there is there is nothing really on places like YouTube or very little online about identifying lace wings in this country from from photographs and what, what you can do. Um, there's just there's just nothing out there. So it's really it's really great that uh, you've been able to sh sort of shine a light on those. On, on what you can do from photographs. And I hope people can really take that away and, and really have a go. And this, this recording is going on YouTube, isn't it? Is that, is that right as well? For anyone that's missed it and is that, is that okay, James? Uh, it's fine with me. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that would be, that would be fantastic. Um, and looking forward to next week. Um, yeah, I just in, in my old job in the in Cumbria, my old manager used to bring in a snow flea normally every winter, having got one from the on the snow on the Lake District. Nice. Which, uh, yeah, so fond memories. He put it under the microscope in the lecture theatre and on the big screen. So yeah, it was great. So anyway, I'll, I'll I'll go into questions now. But that was yeah, that was really brilliant, James. Um, has the scorpion fly vulgaris been found in the UK yet? Uh, to my knowledge, it hasn't yet. Um, whether it is here and just not been identified, because you just have to look at that little black spot um, on the base of the wing. So it could easily be missed, and people could have just recorded it as uh, Panopa communis. So no one, to my knowledge, has actually sent in a record of vulgaris yet. Right, well, Elaine, you could be the first, so, so <laughs> keep looking. Um, I <clears throat> yeah, I should say that I know I know Bug Life have been doing work, haven't they, on the, um, is it brown bordered lace oh, wing? Yes. Am, I, am I getting that the right way around? So, yep, so they have been, I think, you know, doing workshops and teaching people how to identify and find that one on the wood sage in, in Edinburgh, et cetera. Yes. So there has been, yeah, it's, it's great that there has been some, some focus where there is being a, a great rarity. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure there are others, others too. Um, M. Hurtis is also found near Aberdeen. Oh, yes. Yeah, I think that was part of the uh, uh, book life study. Uh, they did find it up along the coast from Edinburgh up into Aberdeen. So, yeah, it, does seem, it, it may be a lot more common than people think if people uh, go looking for it, but... 
yeah, just the problem is no one looks at life swings. So uh, it's hard to know the uh, true distribution of these things. Yeah, I think when when Tony found, Hunter found that um, the that Marum one uh, Balticus mm. on the Sefton coast that hadn't been recorded, no, for, no, for many really years. <laughs> yeah, so mm -hmm. there's there's lots of good things people can do if they go out and look for them and fill in a lot of gaps as well. So they are an excellent group to go out and identify, but I mean. It just is quite difficult because most of them require you to take a specimen to identify them. And understandably, quite a lot of people don't like doing that. So it's probably why we don't have a lot of records coming in, really, which is a shame. But yeah. Um, OK, a bit more coming into the chat. So um, Sonia saying it would be helpful to have copies of the slides. So yeah, copy. So have something on hand when trying to ID from photos. Well, th yeah, that will that will be, Sonia, that will be on the on the YouTube channel. So you can just you can just pause it. Um, if, it if it's helpful, I could uh, do a PDF of the presentation and send that to people if they want. Yeah, I mean, if you're happy to do that, James, yeah, we, yeah, it's, we, it's we could put it on a website as well if you like. Yeah, I'd, I'll send you a copy over to distribute. Okay, great. Um, okay, uh, a question from Bibich. Um, I apologize for my pronunciation. Hi, James. Um, Bibich here from Utorn, the Netherlands. I'm studying Greece slave swings in the Netherlands and was wondering if there were any more records. Uh, Sorry, I'm struggling with the scrolling here. <laughs> if there are any more records of the rare lacewing Nanita in punk data in your country, I know of only one record, uh, but what is the status nowadays? Uh, again, there's not many records at all of that lacewing in, in Britain. So whether it's more common and it's just not been recorded or whether it is just a fairly rare um, still, uh, we we just don't know, but there's only a few records of um, that species in in the British Isles. You know what it what it's associated with and where it occurs. Oh, um, off the top of my head, I don't know uh, what's associated with where it occurs. Um, I think it's in the southern parts of England, but yeah, off the top of my head, I'm not not quite sure with that one. I'm afraid. Okay. Um, a question from Amy Robinson. How do you think we can encourage more people to record lace wings? Uh, that's an excellent question. Um, I think by what I've tried to do today, by showing people can identify them from photographs as opposed to taking specimens, killing the specimen, dissecting them, looking under the microscope. So just by maybe just finding ways of identifying things without killing them is probably the best best way of doing it because like i said understandably people are moving away from killing insects now uh, so finding ways of identifying them either in the fields with a hand lens where you can manipulate them a little bit without doing too much damage or from photographs uh, is probably the best way of doing it and yeah i think other than that yeah the problem yeah. is, is that they are quite hard to identify, which is the biggest stumbling block as compared to things like uh, butterflies or uh, dragonflies, which uh, you can easily identify. Lice wings, you need to look at a lot more finer detail on them. So it is quite difficult. And what you've tried to do this evening, really, James, is, is, is surely well, in, encouraging people to, to record lace wings, showing showing them how to how you can identify some from from photographs yeah stuff like this helps and, and that's what we're trying to do enable james to to, to um share that with you so you know it all helps really i mean it would it would be great if if the if the key was you know um updated and, and made a bit more um you know it's it's obviously it would it was it's, a great key in, in its time but you know it, uh, I think 
I would, yeah, maybe it could be, fat, you know, as it's modernized, uh, made more accessible as well. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so the uh, the books I showed on the side of the um, uh, identification references, the ones from Denmark and Finland, uh, they are absolutely beautiful books, which have loads of great color photographs, as well as nice keys showing uh, the actual parts of the wings rather than just uh, drawings of the um, features. So those books, if we could have a, a British one in a similar style of those would be uh, fantastic. And again, that may inspire more people to go out there and record lace wings. So maybe update of a key is uh, needed. Do you, do you know of any British, new British literature on the horizon, James? Any plans? Um, None that I know of. I mean, if I had the time, I'd, I'd quite like to update the keys. Um, I've been spending a bit of time, but not as much as I'd like to, looking at the larvae of lace wings as well, because there is literally no British key on identifying the larvae of lace wings. So that's another thing which, again, needs to be done. But yeah, it's just having the time and having the money to do this. Yeah. But one day, hopefully. So, okay, uh, a question from uh, Rod Hill. Hi, Rod. Are there described associations for lacewing species apart from the bordered brown? Uh, so, so associations with plants. Um, there's those species which are found on uh, marum grass on uh, sand dunes, they're known of. Uh, a few of the snake flies have been associated with specific trees, uh, but on the whole, uh, there's not really been much uh, done on the insect-plant relationships of uh, lice wings. Uh, when we get records in, lots of people don't really say anything other than where they found the insects, so which site, the grid reference, and what species it is. So if you do record lace wings, it would be good to mention if they're on a specific plant, because that might show us some more uh, plant associations in future as well. But there's nothing really specific as much as like the ones on marum grass and uh, megalomacertus, which is on the wood sage. Are there any um, larvae that you can identify? Um, most of the... Uh, the so the uh, larvae of megalopterans are fairly easy to identify. So they're aquatic larvae and they're easy to identify from photographs. Uh, larvae of green lace wings is what most people come across and they are easy enough to identify, but you are looking at very tiny characters such as small hairs on the, on the body and hairs on the head and things like that. So they are very minute characters you're looking at to identify them. So they're quite difficult from just a photograph. Uh, snake flies, I was talking to the Aspox uh, a few months ago, and you can identify the larvae of snake flies from the pattern on the um, abdomen. So they're quite relatively easy to do. Uh, brown lice wings, no one's done anything much on brown lice wing larvae, and they're, yeah, I'm not quite sure how you'd identify those, and um, macopterans, I think they're fairly easy enough to identify. Uh, and Ciciridae, the sponge flies, you can identify those. I think there was a key done by people in Europe somewhere who've done Ciciridae. So uh, yeah, it's rather long-winded, but the larvae of some can be identified and some of the others need quite a bit of work to do. But like I said, there's just been no key at all of uh, the British fauna, the larvae there. So it's something which really needs to be done. But yeah. There's always lots to be done. I know, um, that's it. Um, and uh, Ian Thurlwell just said, given your comments about larvae, is it worth taking and submitting photos of them? Um, yes, absolutely. Um, uh, th this is the thing. So at the moment, you may not be able to identify them to 
uh, species level, but at some point in the future, you may be able to identify them species level from a photograph. So it is always very useful to um, to submit any of your records really. And yeah, so if you take pictures, yeah, please do submit them either to us directly or to the to I record things like that. So that's the same with um, talking about Macoptera, where you could potentially ID them from the patterns on the wings. So at the moment, you can't really identify the females. But if you can, in the future, identify them from the wing pattern, all the photographs of female macopterans, which people have submitted, will then be able to be identified species level. So it is always good to, um, if you have images of these things, to yeah, definitely submit them. Because one day they may be identifiable, even if they're not now. And you will be able to say it's a, a, a chrysopid larva or a hemorrhoid larva or something like that. Um, can the uh, are they easily bred lace wings? The ones ones you ones you get off trees. Uh, I've done it a few times. Yeah. So um, yeah, you, generally, yeah, they are the green lace wings, chrysopids. I've done it a few times with, and yeah, you can just. Uh, keep them in a test tube and just feed them aphids. And they're quite happy. So uh, then they pupate and hatch out. So they, yeah, relatively easy to breed to themselves. Which again is good for working out keys and identifying the things. So. Yeah. So if we're making progress on the larvae, well, obviously yeah. DNA barcode in from the larvae is if you're well, allowed that... to breed as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. Clearly, a big area for. Yeah. Spreading information in the future. Absolutely. Um, yes. So we can get more records out of the photos, I suppose. Um, okay. I can't see any other questions right now. Has anyone got any final questions for James before we leave it? Or you can save them for next week. Okay. We're we'll, we'll considering everyone's got another chance half past seven next Thursday then I think we'll we'll leave it there for this evening but yeah I'm looking forward to, to next week James that's been that's been yeah that's been brilliant and uh yeah thank you very much awesome. thank you evening. and thank you for everyone for coming and I hope to see you all next week so yeah we'll leave it there cheers yeah. thank you bye bye